Okay, Assalamualaikum and uh, my name is Imran Muhammad Rasid and I'm now with Mustafa Akhyol, one of the famous uh, columnists who are born in Turkey, who also write for many news portals in Turkey and also in New York Times. New York Times. New York Times, I remember. So um, we're going to talk about your book, Islam Without Extreme. So maybe we can start a bit with um, um, about how and why you write the book that you have to deal with. So. Well, I wrote this book uh, about four years ago, uh, maybe five, because I saw a problem in the Muslim world, widespread problem, which I call authoritarianism, right. which is imposing our religion, Islam, to people through state force. Uh, I've seen religion police in Saudi Arabia, um, similar laws in Iran, forcing people to wear the hijab, to be, uh, to, to ban certain things that are considered as sinful, to ban ideas, wrong ideas, blasphemous ideas. So there is a strong tendency, varying from country to country, but generally a tendency to use bans to make people more religious. Right, right, right. Whereas I thought, this, first of all, this is not very compatible with what I see in the Quran. Right. La uh, no compulsion on religion. And many other verses in the Quran emphasize that religion should be based on person's genuine conviction, something that, that cannot be forced. Yes. Uh, secondly, I've seen that the results of this authoritarianism is not very good. It makes people hypocritical rather than genuinely religious. Uh, when it is in the level of ideas, it makes uh, Muslim societies intellectually uh, not very strong, because if you can't read the books that criticize Islam, you can't develop answers uh, against true. those books. So we are creating these intellectual bubbles that uh, we think we're, which is protecting us from harmful ideas. But because we don't face those ideas, we are actually not intellectually maturing. So these are the things that I saw. Then I, then I realized that basically the Muslim world needs more freedom to change, to change for the better. So you mentioned in Islamic traditions. So can you like name us one example? Maybe the prophets times like the Medina states. Are they a secular state in, in terms that they provide freedom to the people? Or it's basically a state where <coughs> religious law are being imposed on the, the communities? Well, how do we ensure freedom? This is a major topic and there are many, there are many aspects of it. In the political realm, a state which doesn't impose a certain view, a religion, or a doctrine, but a state that is pluralist, which respects different trends in society, is of course one of the most important yes. mechanisms we need for freedom. Do we have such an example in, in, in Islamic tradition? Yes, uh, as I try to explain in my book, the very example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Medina is a good example. Uh, when he migrated to Medina from Mecca, out of being uh, out of the threat coming from the polytheists, the mushrikun in, in Mecca, he made a pact with the Jews of Medina, which emphasized that Jews and Muslims are equal partners of the same uh, con same city state. To Jews their religion, to Muslims their religion. Jews were not second class; they were all members of the same ummah, and the word ummah was used for all citizens of Mecca. Uh, sorry, Medina in this but case. Also, they were being sacked afterwards because of the certain political issues. Jews were later expelled from the city gradually because of uh, their uh, cooperation with the Meccan pagans. Right. But that was a political trouble that came later. So the ideal was that Muslims and Jews could sh share the same city with equal basis and with following their uh, traditions. Now, if there were not Jews but other communities, probably they would be in the same charter as well. So today, I think one idea we can take from the Medina Charter is that when you're founding a society, a state, a, 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 a political community, whatever exists in that political community should be treated equally and be brought to the table as a partner, rather than saying this community dominates the political system and everybody should be bowing down to that. But um, people are going to respond to that by saying that Medina's cases, for instance, they have an Islamic law they are being imposed. There's the issue of apostasy. So how do you respond to that? Um, well, the ban on apostasy in classical fiqh is, of course, one of the bones of contention when we speak yes. of Islam and freedom. Uh, that's why I have a whole chapter on this in my yes. book titled Freedom from Islam. 
there I argue that, first of all, this ban on apostasy, which is taken by some scholars and by some Muslims as something indisputable. It's for sure we should ex execute apostates. It is not in the Quran. There is nothing in the Quran which but orders. It's in the hadith. Well, I'll come to that. Yeah. There are verses in the Quran which, which actually guarantees the exact opposite. There are verses in the Quran which actually emphasize f religion should be a matter of free choice. Uh, the ban on apostasy comes from a hadith and the way they're interpreted by medieval scholars. But as I explained in my book, uh, I think there apostasy meant abandoning the Muslim army and joining the enemy army in a war context. So in that case, it meant high treason. High treason. Not, it's, it's political treason. It's not change of, changing your religion out of genuine conviction. Therefore, today, uh, I mean, no army tolerates high treason in the world today in the, in the heat of the battle. But today, if people change their religion out of their genuine conviction, we, can, we should tolerate this. We can't do anything about that. There should be no punishment for this. We Muslims would not be happy to see that, but it happens. And uh, it happens when Christians convert to Islam too, something so we celebrate. There are people actually converting from Muslim to Islam to other, other faith. And so, so well, there the is Quran. a verse in the Quran which speaks of people who, who first believe, then disbelieve, and first believe, and then disbelieve, uh, which shows that at that time, some people could change ideas because it was a new religion. Some people were drawn into Islam and felt uh, then differently. And no actions taken against them. No it. actions were taken against them. We have no record of anybody uh, executed for apostasy during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, moreover, if you execute a convert, which is, I think, grossly wrong, you're also depriving the right from that person to change his mind later in life. And that's true. Maybe that's 20 years will pass and he will feel that actually Islam was the right religion and he will go and return to it. I mean, how dare you stop that person's life because of a change of heart that he had genuinely? Yeah, there's, a, there's also questions of stability. But before we go there, I mean, in your, in your book, there's a chapter on freedom of freedom to sin, I think. In that book, you try to make a distinction that uh, Islam make a distinction that there are sins and there are criminal crimes. So how does the dis distinction work? Well, Islamic fiqh doesn't necessarily make the distinction, but I saw that distinction in the Quran. What I did was, in that freedom to sin chapter, which is controversial, and it's again, let me, this is not a chapter to praise sin, but it was a chapter to say that personal sins should not be crimes from the Islamic uh, conceptualization. I came to this conclusion by looking at the Quran. I looked, what are the hudud, the punishments in the Quran? The hudud, the punishments are for murder, theft, brigandage, Adultery and the accusation, false accusation of adultery. In all of these cases, some, it's, there is a crime in the sense of making somebody else getting hurt. When you steal somebody, you put money, you hurt that person. When you kill somebody, you kill that person. Exactly. In the case of uh, accusation of adultery, you're accusing an innocent woman and co causing her shame. So in that case, you're... And in the case of adultery, you're betraying your spouse and making an illegitimate child maybe. So in that case, it's a harm for somebody else. But there are other Quranic sins. The Quran says don't drink alcohol or uh, gambling is forbidden or uh, not fasting in Ramadan would be a sin without any good reason. But there's no punishment for these in the Quran. There's no punishment for not going to Juma or not doing your prayers. Yes. It would be a sin between you and God. So in my understanding, as I argue that the Quran makes a distinction between what is sin, which is a personal uh, flaw in one's yes. religiosity, then a crime, which is so, uh, hurting somebody else. Therefore, I thought, well, Islamic scholars did qiyas analogy yes. from yes. certain things to bring punishments to all the rest. This was an ishtihad. Today, we can have different ishtihad saying that personal sins should not be seen as crimes. Yes, uh, but we also being told based on the Quranic narrative that we have, that if he committed sins, it's, sins are being committed widely, it's going to upset God. And God is going to actually cause the natural disasters as a kind of a punishment, metaphysical punishment by God, to somehow uh, remind the, the communities that you are doing wrong. So does, sins in the, does it not actually suggest that sins indirectly actually lead to disaster? So uh, should we prevent sins because sins lead to natural disasters? In, kind a, way, of in a way. 
we have a key. Well, first of all, I don't think that the Quran teaches us that sinful societies will necessarily get natural punishments. Such things happened during the time of prophets. Uh, these are miracles. These are. So it's not going to happen. These now. are these are unnatural events. All right. Uh, these are not natural events. This is not a natural course of history. Miracles took place. I mean, Moses divided the water into sea. It doesn't mean that the sea will be divided into two miraculously every time in such an ex exodus event happens. Uh, so, and those tales are narrated in the Quran. Today, when we look in the world, we see that the natural order, word, order of the world flows. There are many sinful parts of the world in which no natural disaster hits. Uh, Las Vegas uh, is not hit by any disaster, and I think. You might going to say it's not yet, but... Yes, but then this is not <laughs> a very tenable argument. Therefore, I don't think that the punishments for sins necessarily come on this that's, earth. That's... I think, and from the Quran's own uh, teaching, I think the punishments for sins comes in the afterlife. And actually, the, there are verses which are saying that God is giving time people on this earth so they may sometimes commit sins or they can be pious to test them. So I think that test is going on, and we should not interfere in that test. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay, interesting. So let, let's talk about um, freedom of freedom of expressions. Um, so what are the limits? Because when we have a freedom of expressions, there should be a limit to it. So, so what are what are the limits? What are the boundaries that we have to draw to see that you can be free to, to see anything, but then there's a things that you can't go beyond. I think the most legitimate uh, limit on freedom of expression is exciting violence. Uh, incitement of violence. When you say this group should be killed, attack, if you're calling people for violent acts, calling people for crimes, uh, that would be, I think, a legitimate way of uh, inciting violence uh, for banning uh, freedom of expression. Uh, other than that, if people are critical uh, of Islam, if people are critical of uh, certain religions, certain points of view, we should not ban that, but we should face that and make an argument against it, or sometimes just ignore it, depending on the nature of the argument. Okay, so we're going to stop now. And just one more. Ah, okay, we're, we're, we're back. Okay. So, okay, um, just one more question before we close our uh, sure. session today. So, um, one of the main arguments against freedom of expression is this, that it's always a dilemma between freedom and also stability. That is that if you allow, the logic works is that if you allow more freedom, more space for free freedom to, to, to flourish, the people going to provoke and it's going to actually cause racial riots. And we have in Paris, for instance, Charlie Hebdo cases. So how, how do you react to these arguments? How do you react to this response? That I think freedom of speech can, can help stability because if people are able to say what they think, they will be less radical. Even though they if you, provoke, uh, if you shut, the, well, if they are calling for violence, okay, I would argue against that. But if they are, if people are able to express their opinions, no matter how fanatic and, and ridiculous that opinion might be, uh, they can say it and they can feel more comfortable. People get more aggressive when you ban them, ban their speech. In Turkey, Kurdish language was banned by authorities for many decades. They said Kurdish is separatist. If people speak Kurdish, they will want to divide, uh, they will want to separate from Turkey. Well, Kurds got angry at the government because their language was banned, and that's why they became uh, divisive. In that sense, I think allowing people to express their opinions, no matter shocking or wrong it to, for us, allows them to feel comfortable in society because they can represent who they are. If we give, deprive them from the right to express who they are, I think they can become more radical. But what happened in Paris, though? Because Paris has a freedom of expression. People can express themselves. But then it leads to, a, in a way, riots and like, murders and stuff. So does it not actually somehow... Well, I mean, I'm not saying freedom of expression is a solution to all the violence problems in the world or terrorist problems in the world. Uh, by the way, French has less freedom of expression than Britain or US. I mean, uh, uh, right. let me tell you that. Uh, I mean, freedom of ex expression, as it's been tested throughout the past few centuries, is one way of allowing actually different ideas to compete with each other so new ideas can emerge. And also for making people express their ideas so feel included in the political system. 
One good question, uh, which also has been an issue in Turkey. Should we allow communists to have their communist propaganda? Uh, some people say, no, no, communism is a bad idea, let's ban it. Well, when you ban it, those people think we should have other means of struggle. They yes. get into armed struggle. Whereas if they express their ideas, then you have the right to counter those ideas in the intellectual sphere. So that dialogue will maybe lead to a more healthy solution. In that sense, I'm not saying freedom of expression it will make the world a heaven on earth. Uh, Nothing is going to do that. But uh, political experience shows that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important principle for any free and harmonious and peaceful society. Okay, um, okay, um, let's, okay la the last question is, I mean, what are the things that you like to see? What are your hopes on the future of Muslim societies? Are we going to embrace liberal ideas of Islam or are we going to be stay at the same spot where we... Basically, we, have a, we have a long century ahead. And uh, it's, I mean, I th first you say right now, in the past two centuries, we are going through the worst era of the Ummah. That's true. Uh, the Ummah began with a glorious success, a beautiful, magnificent civilization. Islam was the most vital, prolific, creative, rich, colorful civilization on earth in its first five yeah. centuries. Then it stagnated. Then in, in the past two centuries, one, yeah. we were shocked to see the modern West coming onto us as a colonial power, as with its new armies and economic and political and cultural power, all that. And that shock has created a lot of dramas and, and, and I think wrong reactions. Uh, we are at a time that we are in a crisis of the Ummah. To get out of this crisis, my argument is that we need more freedom in our societies. Uh, to get out of crisis, some people think that we need more authority. We need more bans. We need more impositions. That's exactly I think problem, it's quite the opposite. Yeah. We need more freedom, diversity, openness, because our early success was allowed by openness and diversity. We had the great intellectual successes of the first centuries because Muslims were able to read Aristotle and. Greek philosophy and other traditions, and they made a synthesis of this with Islam. So we need to open up, and we need to open up our societies and our minds. That's how we will progress. That's how the West has made a progress. Well, um, it's very interesting arguments. Uh, I'm sure that you can actually find more about this in the book. It's already now available in Bahasa Malayu. You can find them in the major bookstores around Malaysia. So uh, thank you very much, Mustafa. For My pleasure. For, for being thank here. you for great questions. Okay, thank you.